Have you ever been a victim of a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme, or some other fraud where a few people make off with all your money? Of course you have. You live under capitalism. In this video, we're looking at market crashes, widely held beliefs, and why talent seems so rare to figure out why the scammers are everywhere. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the best channel to watch in the bath. Have you ever noticed why uh, the title of this video? Maybe not. After all, to us, capitalism is a fishbowl. It's all around us, even though we don't see it, and it's the reason we keep swimming in circles. We're used to the idea of scamming people for money and influence. We're used to thinking everyone could be out to take advantage of us. But we don't stop to consider how strange a situation that is. After all, we consider ourselves, and maybe most people we know, good people who wouldn't go around stealing and defrauding other good people. Why would someone want to scam me, Jermaine? And on the internet service, one of the trusted things of today's society. So where do all the bad people come from? According to Wikipedia, a Ponzi scheme is a form of fraud that lures investors and pays profits to earlier investors with funds for more recent investors. Pyramid schemes and multi-level marketing are often talked about in the same breath as Ponzi schemes because they're also common financial scams made to seem legitimate. People can make money with this kind of grift because it promises a return on investment if you just get more people in. You might have to bring in more people than there are in the world to recoup your investment because that's how geometric progression works, so do the math before you get involved. There's been no end of people pointing out the scams and schemes either. What some of them forget to mention, though, is you can explain why lying, cheating, and stealing are so common if you look at how capitalism works. I would argue the entire global economy and national economies and most businesses and most other social institutions operate in ways that could be likened to schemes of the Ponzi and Pyramid variety. Just trade out more recent investors with workers and funds with work, there we go, and you have a nutshell description of the whole capitalist economy. The structure of most corporations is that of a pyramid. We'll get to why later, but let's start with the what, the how, and the who do you think you are. What's the difference between a legitimate corporation and a pyramid scheme? Let's ask a naked man. What's a pyramid scheme, you ask? Right, it's basically a house of cards where the dickheads at the bottom do all the work and give all the money to the smart guys up at the top. All right, now we People at the top of pyramid schemes get rich by getting more people to join with their money. People who own stock in a publicly traded corporation get rich when the corporation makes more money. Both models rely on the unsustainable promise of continuous growth. Put yourself in the shoes of top execs. You might be able to grow just by being a decent company for a while, but at some point you hit limits. What's an ambitious executive board to do to keep the company profitable? Practically anything. Putting out virtually identical new products, raising prices, cutting salaries, layoffs, sabotage, borrowing money they never intend to pay back and then saying it's just been a good quarter. They might also lobby for subsidies, bailouts, favorable regulations that hamper their competitors, and policies up to and including coups, trade sanctions, and wars. Lots of businesses go bankrupt because of the decisions of the people on the top, but they still get the payout. Sometimes they steal all the money and the people who did the work lose everything. Job, pension, whatever they were promised. The only thing holding some people back is the chance they'll go to prison before the whole thing is resolved. When Enron collapsed in 2001, it was being run like a Ponzi scheme. CEO Kenneth Lay had sold $20 million worth of stock while encouraging his employees to buy it. He assured them the stock was going to skyrocket. Well, how was he to know? It's easy to use words like evil, to call folks like Ken Lay or Charles Ponzi, Sam Bankman Freed, Bernie Madoff, Gina Champion Kane, Lou Pearlman.
Reed Slatkin, R. Allen Stanford, and Elizabeth Holmes, but I'm never satisfied with the explanation that someone's just evil. I want to know how the system they operated under handed them the incentive and the opportunity to cash in. Before that, however, I want to know why we believe them. Social institutions require our faith to sustain them. We have to believe money has value, the law is necessary, and hard work is good. When new people arrive, we teach them our beliefs, like the belief that we only have value when we work. We teach them to hope for the chance to rise above the bottom rung of every ladder, to be more than someone working full-time at a boring job and yet just scraping by. If we didn't teach the new people to work ever harder for an ever-diminishing slice of the pie, the whole economy would have to be completely revamped. Wouldn't that be terrible? You might know the original Ponzi was operating his scam during the early 1920s. Do you know anything else going on in the U.S. in the 1920s? From about 1925, the stock market was booming. Why? Because people were buying into it. Whatever the reality of the U.S. and global economy, Stock markets respond to demand for stocks. Ponzi's contemporary con artists found plenty of people to take advantage of. The more people bought into the boom, the bigger it got. And the easier it became to convince others, I'd be a sucker not to get it. There was nothing behind the boom, except more people investing in what they thought was a boom that would go on until long after they pulled out their money and retired on it. Everyone selling stock, was selling a Ponzi scheme. It took about four years for the bubble to burst, which eventually led the US and Europe to enter one of the worst economic depressions in the history of capitalism. Are we just like in 1929? Or worse? I'm not saying the economy's in a bubble, but it might be. It certainly was in the second half of the 1920s. It was in the late 1990s when people were buying stocks just because they ended in dot com. In the early to mid-2000s, people signed a lot of risky mortgages because it offered them the chance to buy a home. They were assured the reasonable interest rates would last. They didn't realize they'd never be able to pay back their loans because interest rates would rise. Millions of people lost their homes to this scam. And if they lost their homes, who got them? People with more money. Banks, landlords, real estate companies, and the state all took their share of poor people's earnings. The rich and powerful got a little richer and more powerful at the expense of poor people, as usual. It might not have been a textbook Ponzi scheme, but it had the same effect. Under the duress of the market, people signed something whose implications they didn't fully understand, thought it would make them money, then lost everything when the scam was exposed. These are simplistic explanations, of course, but the causes and effects of crashes are often pretty similar. They just take place in different industries, because once you crash one industry, say dot-com startups, you look for the next place to put your money into, like mortgage-backed securities until 2008. Have things changed since then? Among investors, there's been a renewed focus on the rise of technology, automation, the sharing economy, endless stories about the Uber for X, and since around 2010, proclamations about the Internet of Things. These changes have received labels such as Paradigm Shift from McKinsey and Fourth Industrial Revolution from the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, and in more ridiculous formulations have been compared in importance to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Really, they're just selling stock. This was their sales pitch for the next thing they had found to invest in. In all the crashes I've mentioned, Rich investors convinced less financially savvy people who actually needed the money to drop their savings on an investment they weren't going to make money on. The belief the economy will continue to grow and never crash has led to crashes since the tulip bubble in the early days of capitalism. So why is it that most companies, and if you look at them the right way, industries and economies, are shaped like pyramids? Because... That's how you wield power. 
states, corporations, and other hierarchical social institutions are directed by powerful people to secure their power. If you want power, you need people to support you, which means you need to share the proceeds of power, like influence and wealth. Obviously, the fewer people you need to share with, the more there is for you. The last thing you would want is for the people on the bottom to get more, because then they might not have to work for you anymore. So you hire managers, pay them a bit more to buy their loyalty, and tell them to make sure the workers aren't striking, just working. Once you understand the logic of hierarchy, you can see it everywhere. Everything from political parties to your local corner store is a hierarchy. It's sustained by people on the bottom who are forced to accept whatever wages and conditions are on offer in order to continue to survive. But to the people at the top of their organization or industry, there are vast quantities of wealth and influence available. One of the justifications for social hierarchy is the work that's most highly rewarded is something only a few people are capable of doing. But if we apply the logic of hierarchy, we can see the reason only a few rise to the top is the system only lets a few rise to the top. Due to their design, due to the structure of society and organizations, the vast majority of us, however much we work, however good we are, however much wealth we create, 99% of us will never have access to that wealth or power. As a result, most people in most companies and industries are at the bottom of the pyramid and stay there. That says nothing about their abilities. In fact, they might still need to work their hardest and constantly learn just to keep their jobs. One of the biggest lies we've been sold is that talent is rare. As someone who works in the arts, it's absolutely not. Once you realize that, you'll understand how much luck and privilege is involved in being chosen to be one of the few who get the limelight. In any industry considered one of talent, so art, sports, acting, music, a few people are made really famous and therefore make most of the money. A larger number make just enough that it's just another low-paid career like the rest of us have and a probably even larger number muddle along hoping for their big break and never getting it. We often don't hear about the vast inequalities until the workers go on strike, when we realize the people who do most of the work are making just enough to get by, a few people on the top are making seven-figure salaries, and the owners, who don't contribute anything, just own, are worth billions. We know only a few ever make it to the top, but instead of seeing them as well-connected or otherwise privileged over their competitors, we see them as rare geniuses. Like Elon. Elon must be a genius, because he made all this money. Never mind how he got it. Or J.K. Rowling. If genius means taking existing fiction tropes and mashing them together to create the book with the most mainstream appeal, then I guess that's what she is. If you're a publisher, movie maker, record producer, or talent scout, you put most of your efforts into finding the next J.K. Rowling or Taylor Swift, because that's where the money is. Then when you find them, you build them up and say they're the greatest whatever of all time. Lots of companies and industries are similarly incentivized. Even YouTube is like that, as you might know, because there are millions of small creators like me, but we don't get any money from it. You have to have a large number of views and subscribers for a consistent period. And among that small portion of creators who make any money, most don't make enough to make a living off it, so they need to advertise or sell merch. It's only the tiny minority at the top who make a lot off YouTube. That's because it's a capitalist organization. That's how capitalism works. Most people do most of the work and get the least money and credit. Getting rich is held out to us like a carrot. So everyone higher up the hierarchy, bosses, shareholders, landlords, the state, can keep taking most of the value of your labor. The system is rigged against you. Your hard work and talent will not pay off. That's it. Good night, everybody. I, just, I, I would say don't, don't take advice from people like me who've gotten very lucky. You know, mm -hmm. we're very biased. Like, Taylor Swift telling you to follow your dreams is like 
a lottery winner saying, liquidize your assets, buy Powerball tickets. It works. And we're tall white guys. We overcame nothing to be here. Now we have a better idea how the structure of the economy and the use of power keep us near poverty. So how do people who aren't Bo Burnham and Conan O'Brien get rich? Let's go back to economic crashes. After the irrational exuberance dissipates, there tend to be a few businesses left standing. Competitors are crushed under debt and bought out at pennies on the dollar, while the remaining companies turn the industry into a monopoly or an oligopoly. And in fact, that's the only way to make real money at this game. Make lots of bets and find the one winner that can end up monopolizing its industry. With only a handful of firms dominating the market, they can band together and lobby for special treatment, like protection from competition, like all the other industries do. This book looks at the possible bubble that's been growing since 2009 in technology, thanks to the belief in firms like Uber and Airbnb, which the author calls lean platforms, because all they do is create a platform to skim off the top of an industry. Despite all the ways they're supported by investors and states, the profitability of these lean platforms remains largely unproven. Just like the earlier dot-com boom, growth in the lean platform sector is premised on expectations of future profits rather than on actual profits. The hope is that the low-margin business of taxis will eventually pay off once Uber has gained a monopoly position. Until these firms reach monopoly status, and possibly even then, their profitability appears to be generated solely by the removal of costs and the lowering of wages and not by anything substantial. Far from representing the future of work or that of the economy, these models seem likely to fall apart in the coming years. But while they're around, they'll make a few people billionaires. A few people make huge cash from bubbles, then bounce along to inflate their next one. Sounds like a get-rich-quick scheme. Yes, thank you. You will get rich quick. We all will. This behavior creates an incentive to build up a company and then cash out as soon as possible. You might even call it the incentive to steal. You run the business into the ground and screw everyone else, but get rich in the process. You don't have to be good at running a business to have a successful business. You just need to be good at convincing people you're good at business for long enough then grab the cash as the ship goes down. The company might not have had any real foundation in the first place. It might just have had a familiar face at the top or, or a cool new idea along with great PR so they can get millions in funding. In 1999, the height of the dot-com craze, there were 457 IPOs. Oh, sorry. An IPO is when a company goes from being privately owned to publicly traded on a stock exchange. Most were internet and tech stocks. Of those, 117 doubled in price on the first day of trading. Tech and dot-com IPOs were minting new millionaires every day, both at the management level and retail investor level. For most, though, it was all on paper. So look at the incentives we have. We need and want money. And if we get rich, we theoretically don't have to worry about it anymore. Investors want to get in on the next big thing on the ground floor before everyone else hears about it, and then sell when the stock is high. It's a kind of FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Maybe it's financial FOMO or f FOMO. Fear of missing out on the thing that's finally going to make you rich. Business people who want to get rich have the incentive to con and steal and cover it up. The biggest thieves wear suits, and the biggest prize, much bigger than robbing a bank, is to rob shareholders. Imagine you're the CE or FO of a big corporation. You make decent money, but you realize you could make way more if you just played with the figures a little. You know, a few offshore accounts here, a little insider trading there, and soon you've got enough to buy yourself a nice place anywhere in the world and retire. You might even find ways to do it all legally. After all, the legal system is so full of corporation-sized loopholes, you can get away with a lot. A hollowed-out company will still collapse, of course, and everyone will get screwed, but everyone's not you. And every time you lie or screw someone, it gets easier and your conscience gets fainter, so by the time you're rich, you couldn't care less about anyone else. You might tell yourself, if they were smarter, 
if they were ubermensches like I am, they'd be doing what I'm doing. So why are there so many of these scams and cons and pyramids under capitalism? For one thing, hardly any of us are trained to recognize frauds and scams. If we were, we would scrutinize and reject the systems we live under, like government, the media, and work. We've seen how powerful people structure society and organizations like pyramids. We've seen the incentives these structures create. We've seen how ordinary people can make it rich with their own scam. Hey, are you like me? Do you find yourself using the word grifter repeatedly when you're online? Every get-rich-my-way consultant is a grifter. Every pickup artist is a grifter. Every high-profile right-winger is a grifter. They're all trying to sell you something, respectively money, sex, and a place to make fun of liberals. The three things every home needs. Moreover, grifters recognize each other, so they promote each other. Another grift that tends not to get called out as such is the public intellectual. People realize all they need to sell books and seminars is to get an endorsement from someone high up in their field, or someone famous like Oprah. So people build each other up as pundits and gurus and best-selling authors, as if any of that meant they were interested in truth. So if you're listening to one scammer, you might start following dozens more because they talk each other up. They're rich, so we're supposed to reason they know something vital that we don't and teach it in their books and seminars. Couldn't be the other way around, that they're rich because people pay them for their advice, because they're persuasive speakers in expensive suits. But more fundamentally, anyone can get conned if the con artist can sell them something they want. Under capitalism, we need and want money. We need it to live, and the amount we need to live is always rising. A lot of full-time work pays just enough to fulfill the employee's needs, or even less than that. So there's no way either to enjoy the supposed benefits of capitalism, having stuff we like, or to save any money. So we need it, but we want it too, because the more money we have, the more freedom we have. Under capitalism, you're allowed to be free to the extent you can pay for it. If you get enough money, you can live the dream, escaping the capitalist system. That's why the lottery is such a brilliant scam. Keep people poor, but promise them they can win enough money to leave the rat race. Gives people a savior to believe in in return for money, just like the church. Lotteries and scratch cards are a cunning way to tax the poor and hopeful. The odds are so stacked against you, you'll never win, and you'll only lose money. But it's something to hope for. But the rest of us know we probably won't win the lottery. We won't win our freedom by chance. We're taught to work for our freedom. Work hard, work long hours, accept your position at the bottom of the social pyramid. One day, you'll get your big break. The people on top need us to work and keep working so they can continue to live the lives they live. Because it's one big Ponzi scheme. If we stopped working for the people at the top and just took care of each other, the whole system would crumble. Maybe that's what we should do.